My name is Angie Weikert. I'm the Education Director here at MOR. Um, and we have Richard Carr, a paleontologist, who's going to chat with you this morning. But before I turn it over to Richard, I thought I'd give you a, a, just a moment to glimpse into where we're at in Bozeman and a little bit about the Museum of the Rockies. So sounds like our audio is working well. Sounds like the video is doing well. Again, you've got a chat box there on the side of your screen that you can type in questions. I'm going to be your MC for the morning, so you'll see me come and go on and off the camera. I'll say hi to you, and then I'll sneak around behind the scenes, read your questions, and then I'll be able to ask Richard any question that you may have this morning. Uh, so go ahead and use that uh, chat box to let us know what those may be. If you're having any technical difficulties, jump in there as well. Uh, we've got a, uh, our great partners at Streamable Learning that are there to help you too with that uh, IT. So. What we're going to do first is a glimpse into Museum of the Rockies. So I'm going to jump off the screen. I'm going to show you a few pictures of MOR. All right, so here we go. So it'll take me just a minute to pull this up. All right, so hopefully you can see that screen. I'm going to go ahead and put it into this viewer. We'll take just a minute. <clears throat> There it goes. All right. So today we're talking about uh, fossil reptiles, um, mostly marine reptiles, and what those fossils tell us about the Earth's landscape. So as I said, we're here at the Museum of the Rockies. Um, if you have uh, never been to Montana, you are here remotely today, and we're so happy to have you. Montana is located up along the Canadian border. We're right there on the, in the northern Rockies. You can see that little red dot zooming in on Bozeman. We're going to zoom into the state of Montana here. There you go. So there we are. We've got uh, schools from all over uh, Montana here this morning. So we're happy to have you. But there's Bozeman. That's where we are. Just north of Yellowstone National Park. And here's what we look like a little bit this morning. It's, this is, this is uh, it's a little more of a blue sky and clear than what we've got today. But this is the entrance to MOR. Uh, we've got our main doors there on the left, but can you guess what kind of dinosaur, or do you know what kind of dinosaur greets you as you come into MOR? You can go ahead and type into that chat box if you do know. What kind of dinosaur is greeting you as you enter the museum? That is a T-Rex. That is one of our uh, uh, replicas of a T-Rex. It's a bronze replica, and we call him Big Mike. So. There's Big Mike from a different glimpse. So that's looking back out. There's our Bridger Mountains and our Gallatin Valley. But let's go on inside to the museum. MOR has quite a few exhibits, but what we're talking about today are our uh, paleontological collections. And we put those on display in our dinosaurs under the Big Sky exhibit. So this is the entry to the exhibit. You'll see there's a, a few dinosaur models getting ready to parade into our Siebel dinosaur complex. And here we are. Uh, in our first hall, this is the Hall of Giants. Uh, on the left, we've got some fossils from the late Jurassic. And over there on the right, we've got some early Cretaceous fossils. And this is looking down into um, our, one of our exhibit galleries. That is an Allosaurus that's greeting you. Uh, that Allosaurus is actually from, um, the original fossils are from Wyoming, but most of the dinosaurs in our halls are from Montana. <clears throat> Let's take a look at that big swimming thing on the side of the wall there in our hall of giants and we're going to be spending some time talking about that particular thought or that particular uh animal today with richard so uh you can see that we've got kind of a displayed up there we're going to talk about maybe what those fossils tell us about what montana looked like a couple other um uh hallways will lead you into our hall of horns and teeth and we've got a, two great uh, uh, different dinosaurs here on display. We've got T-Rex there on the left and Triceratops on the right. Here's Montana's T-Rex. Um, and if we go right below Montana's T-Rex, that's going to be where we're sitting at right now. So I'm going to zoom back out of this presentation. There we go. So upstairs, we have a, some great exhibits um, and we are sitting right below those down here in our uh, one of our collections rooms. So behind me are thousands of fossils and you're going to get to learn about some of those today. Uh, our paleontologist this morning is Richard Carr. Richard, thanks for being here. Thank you very much, Andy. 
So again, my name is Richard Carr. I am a student at Montana State University here in Bozeman, Montana, um, but I also work as the Paleontology Collections student assistant. And as Angie mentioned, I'm surrounded by all of these cabinets and drawers, and they're filled with thousands of fossils. So first, let me show you a little bit of what I do down here in collections. So in these cabinets, uh, again, are loads and loads of fossils. <clears throat> I'll take out an example of one of them for you guys. So this is the lower jaw um, of a duck-billed dinosaur called a hadrosaur. And uh, I'll hold that up for you guys. And it's really cool. This is where the teeth would be, that kind of stuff. And you can see that there's a little uh, white label painted on there. And so um, most of what my job involves is putting those labels on the fossils and then making sure they have nice little boxes and uh, kind of foam to pad them and protect them uh, so that they have a, a really safe home. And then what I do is I enter the data about those fossils into these big databases so that when visiting researchers and scientists uh, come to our collections and our museum, um, I can help them find the fossils that they're looking for so that they can study them. Uh, so let's take a couple steps back and go over what a fossil is. So fossils are the preserved remains of once living uh, plants and animals. And the scientists who study fossils are called paleontologists. Now paleontologists love to learn about uh, prehistoric organisms, things like woolly mammoths and dinosaurs. And so I'll pull out a dinosaur for you guys here. This is a cast, so a replica. Um, of the skull of a carnivorous or meat-eating dinosaur called Allosaurus. Now, Allosaurus uh, lived in the area about 150 million years ago in the Jurassic period. Now, this period um, is part of a larger um, section of time that we call the Mesozoic era, or the age of dinosaurs. Now, in Montana, in the Mesozoic, um, the landscape looked very different. Today, Montana is what we call a landlocked state. And so it doesn't really touch any sort of ocean or seaway, um, and it's just surrounded by land. But in the time of the dinosaurs, uh, they were really big seaways. And I think Angie has a really cool map to show you guys. Yeah, I'll pop that up right now. So this big seaway, um, as you can see on your screens probably, um, used to extend all the way from the modern day Gulf of Mexico all the way up into the Arctic Circle. Um, and so we have lots of really cool fossils, uh, both on the land where we would find those dinosaurs and then in those seaways. So now I'll, I'll pull up a, a map, a geologic map of the state of Montana. So this is a really cool giant map uh, that was made by uh, the, sorry, Montana Bureau of Mines and Geology in Butte. And uh, as you can see, there's loads of information on this. It's a really kind of complicated map, uh, and there's lots of crazy, wacky colors on it and stuff. Um, what I want to draw your attention to are a lot of these kind of green colors in the map here. Those are mostly from the last period of the Mesozoic era, called the Cretaceous period. So again, this green stuff right around here. And a lot of those, almost the entire eastern half of the state, um, consist of uh, rocks that come from oceans, that big ocean wave that kind of cut uh, the North America in half. Now, as a paleontologist, it is really important not only to focus on the bones and the fossils, but the types of rocks uh, that we find those fossils in. So for example, Allosaurus comes from rocks that are, uh, were deposited in what we call terrestrial or land systems, the so kind of land rocks. Um, but again, this ocean seaway left behind a lot of marine rocks or ocean rocks. Now, how do you know if you're in a land rock versus an ocean rock? Well, one way to tell is you find things like uh, fossil seashells. And so this is a really cool fossil uh, of an animal called an ammonite. Let's see if we can get that to focus for you guys. And um, ammonites are really neat. They're these kind of coiled um, fossils. These are the, the external shells and exoskeletons of these animals. This is the outside. On the inside, you can see they have all these really cool separated chambers. And each one of those chambers could either be filled with water or gas, 
uh, which would kind of control whether they were heavier or lighter so that they could either sink or rise in the oceans. Uh, that way they could either escape predators or um, hunt around for, for prey. Now, ammonites are uh, related to modern day squid and octopus. So here's a model of what an ammonite would have looked like when it was alive. And you can see that it has all these really cool, uh, crazy tentacles and stuff kind of coming out of uh, the opening of the shell back there. <clears throat> now, again, I really like to study marine uh, fossils and animals. And some of those marine animals are actually kind of related to dinosaurs. So today, dinosaurs' closest living relatives are birds and crocodiles. So here I have another replica, a cast, of the skull of a modern day crocodile. Um, now I'm from Florida originally, and so I'm used to seeing lots of alligators and things like that. Um, so I'm no stranger to crocodilians. And today we find most crocodiles in freshwater environments. So places like lakes and rivers and ponds and streams. Um, there are a few species today that can also live in saltwater environments. Um, now, that being said, again, crocodilians are close relatives of dinosaurs, but they are not actually dinosaurs themselves. Uh, now, back in the period, uh, the, the time period that we find dinosaurs, we also have crocodiles, and specifically these big, giant marine crocodiles. So I have a, a cast, again, another replica, of one of the skulls of a giant crocodile that we found here in Montana. And as you can see in the mouth here, there are lots of really long, uh, kind of sharp teeth, and those would be great for catching uh, slippery prey, kind of like fish and squid, um, as they're hunting in the oceans. And then, much like modern day crocodiles, the nostrils of these crocodiles are positioned at the very tip of the nose and up on top, so that it would be really easy uh, for these crocodiles to just kind of stick their noses um, up above the surface of the water to kind of get a big gulp of air uh, before diving back down to uh, hunt these, uh, their animals. Now, I think we have a question. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us why crocodiles are not dinosaurs? That's a good question. So um, I have some models here for you guys. So here's a model of a modern day alligator. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, we'll give it just a minute to get this in there. It takes just a, just a few seconds to figure out what you're holding. So um, as you can see, this is kind of like looking down on the alligator. Um, their legs kind of sprawl off to the sides of the animal. Whereas dinosaurs, here's a model of a sauropod or a long neck dinosaur, uh, their legs um, kind of stick out straight underneath the animal instead of sprawling off to the side. Um, and that's one of the big main differences uh, between crocodilians and dinosaurs. Now, uh, while we do have these really cool giant marine crocodiles from the fossil record of Montana, there are even weirder and crazier uh, prehistoric sea animals that we find in Montana as well. So I'm going to hold up uh, a model here really quick of a really famous type of marine animal that we find in Montana. This is a plesiosaur. Now plesiosaurs are, have a lot of really cool features about them. Uh, they have these long sort of spindly necks that we see right here. They also have four uh, large muscular paddles on either side of them. Uh, those are their limbs now. And then you probably can't really see it in the model itself, but in the skull, we'll get back to this later, they have really neat snaggly teeth. So let's go back and focus on uh, the flipper first. So I'm gonna hold up one of these paddles uh, from a real plesiosaur that we found here in Montana. Uh, now, again, this is the real fossil, and so it's covered in uh, this plastic because the fossil is a little bit fragile, and we don't want pieces of it to kind of fall out and break. Now, what do you guys think that these individual bones are in the flipper down here? You can see they're kind of segmented right there. Go ahead and type in your chat box if you have a guess as to what those individual bones are that Richard's pointing to. All right, take a guess there. What do you think those are? Got some starting to come in. All those little bones on the flipper. We've got some um, guesses of joints. They look like fingers, possibly mm -hmm. scales or knuckles. A hand. Yeah, those are all really good guesses. Yeah, that's exactly what they are. They're individual bones from the fingers. So plesiosaurs, like whales and sea turtles, originally evolved 
from uh, land living ancestors. And so they used to have individual fingers. But then, much like modern day seals uh, or sea turtles and whales, as they became better adapted to life in the water, those fingers all kind of came together and they were covered with a layer of muscle and skin that made one big paddle. And those big paddles uh, are great. They act like oars, which are really uh, strong and kind of help them move through the water really efficiently. <clears throat> now, there are two main types of uh, plesiosaurs that we find here in Montana. Um, <clears throat> here are casts of two skulls of plesiosaurs from the state. Um, this is one <clears throat> that has, uh, that's kind of the more typical group, the more common group of plesiosaurs. They have sort of shorter necks, uh, sorry, shorter skulls, but really long necks. But then there's another group that has really long skulls and actually pretty short necks. And as you can see, uh, both of these pretty fearsome looking skulls have uh, rows of really long, sharp, interlocking teeth. And we think that those teeth would have kind of acted like a cage to sort of trap slippery prey items like, again, fish and squid, uh, which would have made up the, the majority of the diet um, or the food things that these guys would have been eating. So Richard, we have a couple questions that are coming in. Yeah. Um, can you tell us why some plesiosaurs have long necks and if the, the necks uh, are as long as their bodies? Right, so that's a really good question. Um, in many cases, the uh, plesiosaurs that have the long necks actually have uh, necks that are longer than the total length of their body. Now, scientists think that they have these long necks uh, because, so these are usually, like many of them, get to the size of school buses and sometimes even longer than that. So these are pretty big animals. And as you can see, they have these really bulky kind of uh, bodies and rib cages. And the things that they eat, like fish and squid, um, usually have pretty good eyesight, and they would kind of be spooked and scared away um, if an animal with such a big body just kind of swam into the middle of a school trying to eat them. So paleontologists think that they evolved these long necks so that they can easily just raise their small heads um, into the middle of the schools um, and kind of sneak up on these fish and squid uh, so that they would have been easier to catch. Yeah, good question. So Richard, you're holding a model. Can you tell us how big um, a plesiosaur would be if you, if you were to have the real fossils in front of you? Right, so uh, the real fossils of plesiosaurs can actually vary um, pretty, a, a lot actually, pretty substantially. So some uh, plesiosaurs that we find are about like six feet long, and then others get to be around like 40 feet long. Um, so it kind of depends. A lot of the uh, plesiosaurs that we find here in Montana uh, are typically those larger ones with the, the really long necks, but some of the ones that have the shorter necks and the longer skulls are usually about 10 to 12 feet long. Yeah. I have two more questions sure. for you. Um, students are making observations right now of uh, other the features of the plesiosaur that they recognize in other animals. Yeah. So with this long neck, is the plesiosaur related to brontosaurus or, or uh, apatosaurus? Right, so that is a good question, uh, but no. So um, crocodiles are kind of cousins to dinosaurs and plesiosaurs are cousins to crocodiles. So um, if you're looking at the evolutionary family tree of dinosaurs, like these long neck dinosaurs, uh, you would sort of have a fork where there's crocodiles and uh, dinosaurs are kind of close and then plesiosaurs would be kind of further away from them. So it's basically plesiosaurs evolved long necks just like sauropods did uh, because it was kind of handy for the environment that they lived in, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're related. Great. The other question is about mm -hmm. the flipper actually. Sure. Um, we talked about all of those little small bones um, and that they are like fingers. Yes. So if they're like fingers, would a plesiosaur be related to a human? Because we have fingers also. That's a good question. Um, no, that's not as necessarily the case, uh, because when you think of things like uh, lizards or um, what do you call it, crocodiles, um, other you know reptiles um, and other mammals uh, that aren't necessarily related to uh, humans, like for example um, mice and stuff. All of those animals also have fingers, and it doesn't necessarily imply um, that they're related to humans. They look the same because if you trace the evolution of individual fingers, they all come from one ancestor. And that's about as close as you get to humans and plesiosaurs being related, but that's very far back in the fossil record. 
Yeah. Great. And that's actually another question, too, is can you tell us again when, what era this, the plesiosaurs lived? Right. So plesiosaurs um, are, much like dinosaurs, found throughout pretty much the entirety of the Mesozoic era. So we find them in the Triassic period, the Jurassic period, and the Cretaceous period. Uh, the fossils that we find of uh, uh, plesiosaurs here in Montana uh, are almost all from the Cretaceous period, though. And we uh, have a couple folks asking about plesiosaurs and Loch Ness monsters. Are they related? Are they the same? Right. So some people who think they've seen a uh, Loch Ness monster have claimed that uh, it looks a lot like a plesiosaur. Um, but they don't really have fantastic photos. And um, it's kind of unlikely that plesiosaurs uh, would have survived all the way from the age of the dinosaurs uh, to the present day. Great. A lot of great questions. Yeah. I think we can look at some other cool stuff. Cool. So now we'll move on to my favorite group of uh, fossil marine reptiles, and those are mosasaurs. So for those of you less familiar uh, with mosasaurs, here's a model of one. Uh, and much like plesiosaurs, they kind of have these uh, four paddles, uh, which would be their, their legs and hands. Um, but those are kind of small. You can see that they're more circular shaped and not like the big long oars and paddles that you see in plesiosaurs. Instead, mosasaurs would have relied on their tail to kind of uh, power them through the water. Now I'm going to hold up a really cool fossil, again from Montana, um, of a real life mosasaur snout. So what you're looking at is the very tip of the snout here. Um, you can see all of its long kind of curved teeth, backwards facing teeth. Um, and then in life, if we had the complete skull for this guy, this would actually be the border of the nostril right there. And then the eye socket would be back here. So if this animal were alive, there'd be a, a little eye back there kind of looking back at you guys. Now, mosasaurs have uh, modern day relatives. Um, and the closest relatives to mosasaurs are things like lizards and snakes. So I'm going to hold up for you guys an anaconda skull. So this is a cast of a modern day snake. Um, now, as you can see, they have these really long backwards facing teeth as well. And you'll also notice that on the lower jaw, they have this big crack going through the jaw. And where the two lower jaws meet, um, they don't, the bones don't actually touch. There's a little bit of a gap there. And um, that actually allows the snakes to sort of open up their mouth extra wide and actually unhinge their jaws so that they can swallow larger prey items than most other animals. Uh, and we find those same features, again, that crack in the jaw and the gap between the lower jaws in mosasaurs. Now, on the underside of this anaconda skull, uh, it might be a little tricky to see, uh, but there are rows of teeth, extra rows of teeth on the roof of the mouth. And that basically makes sure that um, any sort of food item that comes into the mouth of the snake uh, is definitely going down the gullet. And again, just like those weird jaws, we see these extra rows of teeth um, in the jaws of mosasaurs, uh, which is super cool. Now, why do mosasaurs have such weird jaws and extra teeth? What are they eating? Uh, well, if you guys remember the ammonite that I uh, showed you guys earlier, that was a much smaller one. This is only a part of a way larger ammonite shell. Uh, again, this one's from Montana. And what you can see here are uh, these three circles match up perfectly with the size and shape uh, of mosasaur teeth. And so we believe that this ammonite uh, was bitten and probably eaten by a big mosasaur. Now we know from the fossil record that mosasaurs also ate things uh, like fish, sea turtles, plesiosaurs, and even other mosasaurs, which is pretty crazy. So if you were to go swimming in the oceans of Montana um, back in the late Cretaceous period, um, you probably would have bumped into some pretty big, scary, and uh, weird uh, marine animals and stuff. But then in the, uh, at the end of the Cretaceous period, about 66 million years ago, there was a huge extinction event. And that extinction event wiped out the dinosaurs, the plesiosaurs, the mosasaurs, and the ammonites. <clears throat> Can you tell us if there are any marine animals that survived that extinction, Richard? That's a good question. So yes, um, while few of the marine reptiles from the Cretaceous period and the Mesozoic survived, uh, we do still have sea turtles. So this is the skull of a modern day sea turtle. You can see its eye sockets there. Here's the beak, uh, the little ear is back there, and then uh, part of the nostril is present there. And so uh, sea turtles evolved in the time of dinosaurs, and we still have them today. Um, now, that being said, most of these marine animals, uh, marine reptiles, went extinct um, at this Cretaceous extinction event. Um, and instead, we have different animals um, that kind of evolved to take their place, uh, like marine mammals. 
So can anyone tell me what this is a skull of? All right, so if you've got a guess as to what uh, animal that skull belongs to, type it into the chat box. Can you guess what animal that skull is from? It might take a, uh, a few seconds here for folks to think about it and type in. So it's got a really long snout. It has small kind of needle-like teeth. The eye sockets are back here. Uh, the nostrils, this is a little hint, the nostrils are way up on top of the head. Got a lot of great uh, guesses coming in. We have saw shark, pelican, bird, swordfish, a few dolphins, alligator, pterodactyl, something related to a dolphin. Uh, that looks like about it. Yeah, so those are all really good guesses, but this is the cast of a modern day dolphin. So for those of you who guess dolphin, you are correct. Um, in life, dolphins have this really big uh, organ called a melon that helps them uh, echolocate and find their prey. Um, so again, while we don't have marine reptiles, there are still uh, really cool large uh, marine animals that have kind of filled their place uh, in the ecosystems. Now the big takeaway message uh, from this lecture would, uh, would be that while uh, Montana and the world really uh, are famous in the Mesozoic era for their dinosaurs, um, in the seas of Montana there are also a handful of really crazy and super interesting uh, marine reptiles and other animals as well. Uh, so thank you very much for watching and I think we have some time for questions. Yeah, we've got quite a few that are here. Um, so can you tell us about, let's go back to the sea turtle. sea turtle. And there are a few questions about um, if turtles are related to any of these animals that, they sh that you showed us today. Right, so that's a really good question. Uh, it's not totally, completely sure. We're only just now learning a lot more about um, the very base of the family tree of sea turtles. So before, we didn't have a really good picture of what the earliest sea turtles looked like. Um, but now, some people think that um, plesiosaurs might be uh, the closest cousins of sea turtles. Uh, sea turtles are very distantly related to things like dinosaurs, crocodilians, and mosasaurs. Um, so there's not a whole lot of uh, animals we have today that are really close cousins of sea turtles. Great. We have several questions on the plesiosaur. Okay. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a few of them here. Um, how do you know what their skin looked like or what colors they were? Right. That's actually a good question. So um, both of those uh, in the past were usually, the answer to that question was usually, well, it's kind of a best guess. Uh, but now we actually have really cool fossils. There's one uh, that was recently discovered in Mexico um, where the skin impressions are very well preserved in the fossil. And so we know that they have these really small uh, kind of scales. And then in some cases as well, um, the coloration or what we call the pigment um, is also preserved. And so we know that um, most plesiosaurs were probably kind of like, if you know what orcas and killer whales look like, they're sort of dark on top and then lighter colored on the bottom. That's called countershading. And it's a color pattern that's really common in marine animals because it camouflages them really well from above and below. Great. Uh, the plesiosaur fossils that we have, where were they found in Montana? Right, so I can pull out this uh, state geologic map again. Great. Uh, most of the fossils um, that we have in uh, our collections of plesiosaurs and actually mosasaurs are from the eastern part of the state. Um, <clears throat> so for any of you tuning in from Billings, Montana, there are a couple uh, mosasaurs kind of from the south central and southeast part of the state. Um, but we also find a lot of them um, up in the, the northeastern part of the state as well. Uh, again, most of this uh, green uh, area of the map is uh, basically these marine rocks where we find a lot of the plesiosaurs and mosasaurs. Yeah. Do we have any fossils of the plesiosaur rib cage? Um, yes. Um, most of the ones that we have are really big and a little too heavy for me uh, to carry. <laughs> but for any of you visiting uh, Museum of the Rockies in the future, we should have about one or two um, on display for you guys to see. Great. What did plesiosaurs eat? So we know from fossilized stomach contents um, that plesiosaurs ate things like uh, fish and squid, uh, sometimes ammonites, although sometimes their shells were too large and hard for them. Um, but yeah, usually kind of smaller and slipperier um, animals. If a plesiosaur tail gets cut off, could it grow back? Uh, that's a really good question. 
So it's kind of hard to tell. Um, in modern day lizards, they have special bones and ligaments um, that we can kind of see, and that tells us that they are capable of detaching their tail and then, you know, eventually regrowing it back. And I don't really think that we see those structures in plesiosaur tails. Most plesiosaurs also have pretty short, kind of stumpy little tails, uh, and so that's another reason why we don't really think that they were uh, capable of regrowing. Good question. Great. Uh, let's talk about the extinction event. So, um, what, how, how do we think dinosaurs went extinct, and how did the sea turtle make it past the extinction? Yeah, both really good questions. So, uh, right now, the two leading kind of co-contributors um, to the uh, mass extinction at the end of the Cretaceous period are thought to be a big asteroid uh, that kind of comes from space and hits the Earth um, in the Gulf of Mexico, and then also really large volcanoes uh, that were erupting in India um, and called the Deccan Traps. And uh, the combination of those two um, factors and events uh, would have caused, kicked up a lot of dust and dirt and a bunch of chemicals in the air that probably would have uh, blocked out the sun and prevented things like plants and um, photosynthetic uh, plankton, so uh, basically plant plankton, uh, from producing their own food. And then because plants are at the base of the food chain, um, that kind of would have affected everyone else that was higher uh, in the food chain, the predators and whatnot. Now, why sea turtles uh, survive and mosasaurs and plesiosaurs and ammonites don't is really, it's a good, great question that at the moment nobody has the answer to. Um, crocodiles also make it past the uh, Cretaceous extinction, and so do things like sharks and fish. Um, so it's not completely, entirely uh, certain why exactly those groups survive and others don't. Yeah. Great. So you've showed us uh, the geologic map. We have a few questions uh, asking about how we find fossils. Um, how long it takes to put fossils back together. Yeah. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about the process of finding fossils and getting them here to the museum? Sure, yeah. So I think we have um, an example of what we call a jacket. Um, here we go. So what happens first is uh, we find fossils. You kind of, you sort of have to have a basic understanding of the geology of the area you're looking in first uh, to kind of know, like, am I in the right age rocks? Am I in the right types of rocks uh, to be able to find fossils? And then what you do is you kind of, you walk around and you kind of look at the ground and you just have to keep your eyes peeled uh, for things that look like bone and that look sort of different from the, the general rocks of the area. Once you find that bone, then you have to really carefully sort of dig around it. Um, and then eventually what you do is you cover it in a mixture, you cover the fossils in a mixture of um, plaster and burlap, um, which makes these uh, what are called field jackets. And so um, they're usually kind of white and sort of dusty looking like that. And um, when you put it on, it's kind of like this really thick, soupy paste. Um, and then over time, um, it usually hardens. And then that protects the bone so that you can carry it from the field where you found the, um, the dinosaurs or whatever fossils you're looking for back to a place like a museum or a university where you can then kind of uh, clean the bones off and glue them back together. So here's kind of what the inside of one of these fossil jackets looks like. Um, so when this jacket was made, uh, this area right here would have been filled with dirt and then the, the row of fossils there. Um, and then it would have been up to the job of someone like a preparator, someone who prepares the fossils, to kind of uh, dig in there and clean off the bone and then piece it back together. Um, and then after that process, it comes to me in collections uh, where I kind of paint the labels on it, uh, give it a nice little home and put it in a drawer or a shelf um, so that other scientists can study it. Um, how deep can the fossils be buried? That's a good question. So if you bury fossils or any sort of rock too deep in the Earth's crust, uh, those fossils and those rocks actually start to melt. Um, so while it's kind of hard to say, um, <clears throat> their ge geology is a, a, involves a lot of complicated processes. And so sometimes you can bury a fossil and the rocks that are, it, it's uh, preserved in uh, very deep. And then later, uh, a mountain might lift up those rocks. And then the rocks that are above it will be eroded away, and you'll have the, that fossil exposed. So it just it kind of depends on uh, the geologic history of the area that you're living in, um, and then also the types of fossils and rocks that you're looking at. Um, a good uh, depth estimate that I have, um, probably not much more than a couple uh, hundred meters. Uh, when paleontologists look for fossils, they usually only look at the surface, though. Yeah, we don't really dig down and make vines to look for fossils, no.
Uh, tell us about the different colors on the fossils. What, why, mm -hmm. what makes the color of fossils and why are the ones that you showed us different? Right. So the color of fossils um, is usually dependent on, again, the type of rock that it's preserved in. Um, so fossilization process is another kind of complicated process that involves um, sometimes the partial uh, replacement of living tissue with things like rocks and minerals. And in that process, uh, sometimes certain minerals will replace certain types of uh, bone and cartilage tissues. And um, depending on what that, those minerals are, uh, that can kind of affect uh, the overall color of the bone. Sometimes you'll find um, really dark fossils and light rock. Sometimes you'll find dark fossils and dark rock. Um, and it just has to do with uh, what we call the geochemistry um, of the area. Great. Um, one more question about um, finding fossils. Uh, are people still finding fossils in Montana? And do we have any fossils close to the Museum of the Rockies? Uh, yes, there is a lot of uh, fossil finding <laughs> happening in Montana. So unlike a lot of other states uh, in the United States and just areas of the world uh, where you have like big cities and things like that, Montana doesn't have a very big population. And so a lot of the land on the state um, is kind of, it's um, mostly empty and not covered by things like roads, sidewalks, or buildings. And so it's a lot easier for paleontologists in the state of Montana to kind of walk around and look for these fossils. Um, I think some of the closest fossils that have been found uh, to the city of Bozeman are usually um, mammal fossils. There are a couple uh, places where you can find dinosaur fossils close to Bozeman, um, but most of these uh, fossils that we find are things like fossil horses, uh, woolly mammoths, um, and I think some fossilized dogs as well. Are all the fossils that you showed us today from Montana? Um, yes, with the exception of uh, Big Al. So um, I think Angie mentioned it uh, earlier in the talk, but this um, Allosaurus uh, fossil is actually technically from the state of Wyoming, which is uh, directly uh, south of the state of Montana. Um, that being said, we do find the same rocks and uh, other specimens of Allosaurus in Montana. Great. Uh, so let's take a look back at the fossils. We have quite a few questions coming in about teeth um, on various uh, skulls that you showed us today. Sure. So can you compare how many teeth these, dip, uh, let's see, the crocodile, one right. of the plesiosaurs, and then the dolphin, how many sure. teeth those, those animals have? Right. Have? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. And I don't have an exact count uh, for all the teeth. Um, I know that the uh, crocodile and the dolphin definitely I think have more teeth than the plesiosaur um, and so let me get the flashlight out again again we have uh, the row of teeth right here and you can kind of see them all throughout this really long snout uh, that this crocodile has um, but we also see a, a pretty similar structure in the dolphin and so uh, the dolphin has uh, lots of really fine teeth um, all the way from kind of here in the jaw up to the very front and tip of the snout um, and then plesiosaurs kind of do the same thing, where they just kind of fill their jaw with uh, as many teeth as they can. Here's the other side of that plesiosaur I showed you. And again, you can see all these really long interlocking teeth. I, again, don't have a good count for the number of teeth that we have, um, but almost all of those teeth are really uh, similar in their shape. And that's because um, they're all adapted for grabbing onto uh, really slippery, small food items like fish and squid. Right. Um, can you clarify again what the difference between marine reptiles and dinosaurs are for us? Right. So again, kind of like um, what we went over with the crocodilian, um, crocodiles and almost all the rest of these marine reptiles have legs that kind of uh, sprawl out to the sides, whereas dinosaurs' legs are directly below their body. Um, there are also some weird kind of complicated differences um, in the shapes of the skulls and the placement of these different holes that they have uh, in their heads uh, that, are, that are supposed to be there. Um, and that is one of the, those are the two best ways to kind of tell apart um, dinosaurs from all these different uh, evolutionarily different groups of marine reptiles. Great. So we spent a lot of time talking about marine reptiles today, mm -hmm. but we have a few dinosaur questions for you. Sure. <laughs> uh, have we found a complete dinosaur in Montana? 
Yes, yeah, there are a number of uh, really super complete and then mostly complete um, fossil dinosaurs from Montana. If any of you ever get the chance to visit Museum of the Rockies, we have a load of them up on display um, upstairs in our exhibit hall. We have things like um, Tyrannosaurus rex, um, we have some um, duck-billed dinosaurs, we have, let's see, um, kind of raptors like Deinonychus. Uh, we have lots of really cool and very complete um, and super informative uh, dinosaur skeletons, yeah. When you are out looking for dinosaurs, how do you know it's a dinosaur and not something else? Right, so that can be kind of tricky sometimes because usually speaking, we don't find those really complete skeletons. When we're looking for fossils out in the field, you'll usually only see like a couple little bones kind of poking out of the ground. And then that's when you have to sort of dig and uh, find the rest of it. And usually speaking, um, you know, not all the bones will be there. Sometimes some of the bones will be sort of broken. Um, and sometimes they'll be arranged in really weird ways that make it kind of difficult and confusing to identify what it is you're looking at. Usually, you you, um, uh, as a paleontologist, you kind of you get enough kind of background training uh, to sort of be able to spot and predict what types of fossils you'll find in different formations. Uh, but sometimes it kind of you have to wait until the whole thing is prepared uh, at a museum or a university to really definitively say what exactly you're looking at. Um, how about uh, when you uh, dinosaurs? What's the biggest dinosaur and what's the biggest dinosaur bone we found? Okay, so I don't have exact measurements for you guys, um, but some of the largest dinosaurs and some of the largest land animals that ever evolved um, are these long neck dinosaurs. So these kind of sauropods, um, and these guys can weigh um, like multiple, if you were to compare their weight to elephants, they can weigh multiple elements. It's kind of a weird, crazy unit to think about and stuff. But these are massive animals that uh, some of the largest ones get to be about the size of blue whales and nearly almost 100 feet long. Um, and so some of the largest dinosaur bones that we find would probably be uh, the leg bones from those really large sauropods. They're super heavy uh, and also pretty long and thick. They almost look like tree trunks. Um, there are also really cool dinosaurs called ceratopsians. So if you think of like uh, Triceratops and Stracosaurus, Protoceratops, um, some, of the, um, some of the last of the ceratopsian dinosaurs to evolve have really, really big skulls uh, because they have those big frills and large horns. And uh, those bones get to be pretty big as well. Uh, one more dinosaur question, and then we'll go back to marine reptiles. Sure. Um, there are two different species that we're interested in knowing if they're from Mon or it found in Montana: Velociraptor and Megalodon. Right. So Velociraptor is uh, from a country called Mongolia, which is kind of north of China over in the continent of Asia. So we don't really find Velociraptor in Montana, uh, but we do find Velociraptor's cousins. Uh, there are other raptor-like dinosaurs here in Montana. Some of the most famous ones would be um, like Deinonychus, for example, uh, and they have those kind of uh, sickle killer claws on their feet. Um, now, uh, Carcharodon megalodon is a really cool fossil. Um, I actually really like fossil fish, they're my favorite, and megalodon is a really cool fossil, um, but those actually evolved long after the seaway that kind of cuts North America in half disappears. So by the time megalodon um, evolves, we don't have a seaway in Montana anymore. So we don't find megalodon in Montana, unfortunately. <laughs> Great, so let's go back to the seaway. Sure. Um, did all of these animals live in the seaway, in the Western Interior Seaway at the same time? So, yes and no. Um, <clears throat> we do have marine crocodiles that live with plesiosaurs and plesiosaurs that live with mosasaurs, um, but a lot of the species that I've shown you today are from um, different rock levels and different kind of ages uh, of what we call geologic formations within this Western Interior Seaway. So as the prehistoric Earth's uh, kind of climate changed um, dramatically, it kind of got warmer and sometimes colder, and the sea level rose and fell, uh, this seaway got like bigger and smaller at different periods in time. And when that happened, different species uh, would sometimes evolve and coexist uh, or sometimes go extinct um, in that seaway. So no, we don't really get like this particular species living with the mosasaur that I showed you, um, but we do have mosasaurs as a big group living alongside plesiosaurs as a big group. And at the same time that they're swimming in the oceans, uh, you have things like dinosaurs uh, kind of stomping around on land. Cool. Let's talk about this marine crocodile. Yeah. 
Um, can you tell us how big the whole crocodile would have been? That's a, a really good question because as you can see, it is a lot bigger um, than this kind of modern day crocodile uh, that we have um, kind of right next to it. There are bigger crocodilians uh, that whose skulls are a little bit um, closer in size to this prehistoric one. Um, we didn't find the entire skeleton uh, for this particular um, extinct crocodile, but it is a really big one. And if I had to guess, I would say somewhere between 15 and maybe even 20 feet long. It was a really big animal. Right. So the modern crocodile and yeah. this fossilized crocodile, their noses look really different. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us why the the fossilized crocodile had a longer snout? Right. Uh, that's a really good question. And we actually see those kind of differences in the shapes of crocodile noses today. So today uh, there's a really cool crocodilian called Gariel, um, and they have these really long, very skinny noses. Um, and then you have things like alligators and saltwater crocodiles or Nile crocodiles that have kind of more broader um, <clears throat> snouts. And that has to do with the types of food that they eat. So this particular crocodile um, is, again, from a freshwater environment and is probably a little bit better adapted to eating uh, larger prey items and not just fish. Um, so it might also eat things like small mammals, uh, birds, other reptiles. Uh, whereas this giant marine crocodile was probably only eating things like uh, fish and squid. And so it needs to have these longer, skinnier snouts to more quickly kind of swing its head through the water to chase after those food items. Great. This is going to be our last question this morning. Cool. Uh, can you tell us which um, it, uh, the the student asked which marine dinosaur, so we may want to clarify that, mm -hmm. had the biggest skull that we found. Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, there technically are no marine dinosaurs. Um, recently, some, pe some paleontologists believe that they found um, an aquatic dinosaur, a semi-aquatic dinosaur, that's uh, Spinosaurus, which is a really big famous one from Africa, um, but that is not technically a marine animal. That only lives in freshwater environments and then also was still able to kind of walk on land. Um, so marine dinosaurs and marine reptiles are technically two different things. One of the largest uh, skulls from a marine reptile that we've ever found is kind of a distant cousin of plesiosaurs. They're called pleosaurs. So some of you may be familiar with a large marine reptile uh, called Leoplorodon. Um, this is a, a really large pleosaur that we find all over the world. And they have skulls that are probably, um, I don't know if you can see this whole table, but their skulls are easily uh, a little bit longer than this whole table that all these specimens are sitting on. Um, and so we think that those animals were uh, probably really large bodied as well. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Well, thank cool. you so much, Richard. I hope you all had a great morning with us. Um, thank you so much for being here and joining us. A uh, couple, uh, three things before we sign off. Uh, if you have questions, if we didn't get to your question, feel free to send us an email. We'd love to follow up with you and get all of those questions answered. I typed our email address into that chat box. So go ahead and grab that um, and let us know if you've got any feedback about this morning's program too. Uh, the second one, join us again. We're doing another live stream event on December 5th. Uh, you can find information about it either on the Streamable Learning website or at museumoftherockies.org. Go underneath the Education tab, uh, go to the Schools tab, and then there's a live stream page. So please join us on December 5th. And then the last one is if you're in Montana and want to come see us on a field trip, we would love to have you. Field trips to the Museum of the Rockies are free of charge, and we reimburse up to half of your bus costs. So we would love to have you come see us here in Bozeman. Uh, but thank you so much for being here. Uh, thanks for all your fantastic questions. And we hope to see you again on December 5th. Yeah, thank you.